If you ask me who my God is, on whose name I call, if you ask me who my God is, He's the God of us all, Allah the Merciful. If you ask me what my book is that I hold in my hand, if you ask me what my book is, it's the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran. Mm-hmm. Assalamu alaikum and peace, and welcome to this episode of Misconceptions. I am Muhammad Hashim, your host. And today, again, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Sheikh uh, Estes is with us from America. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, salam rahmatullah. Also with us today, we have our um, studio audience once again. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, salam alaikum. Today, inshallah, we're going to talk about something really deep peace and war. What does mm. Islam mean? Is Islam peace or is Islam war? The show is all about misconceptions from Muslims and non Muslims. So. I think it's, it's, uh, it's fitting now that we can talk about peace and war, because uh, is Islam really peace or is it war? Is it violent? So, so Sheikh, how do we begin such a vast topic about peace and war in Islam? <laughs> well, first of all, as you know, Islam itself has a meaning, which we've discussed before, that Islam is the surrender and submission yeah. in peace, voluntary peace, to Almighty God. And it doesn't necessarily mean peace. Islam does not mean peace. We True. Yeah, exactly right. Mm. We derive the peace out of there by being in a state of peace with whatever Almighty God gives us. Yeah. So that we can't rely on the word for the meaning, but now let us look to some evidences, though. What's going on in the world today? What's taken place for the past 1,400 years? And there are those that hold very strong to the concept that Whatever you call the religion, whatever the word means, but look at the results. We're seeing war. And are we seeing war? And the answer is absolutely. We are seeing wars. Now, does Islam encourage this? And then the other side of the coin, you said peace. And what about this peace? And how do you try to drive it? We do hear a lot of Muslims talking about that. Maybe we should go to the studio audience and see if there are any questions regarding peace and war in Islam. Yes, I heard a lot of people, they say that Islam is all about war. Yes, uh, and I've heard that it's all about peace. Which one is it then? So, well, Sheikh, you've got two of them there, peace and war. Where do we Obviously, begin? Obviously, <laughs> these are about as opposite as you can get. Yeah. However, there is a concept in Islam about balance. There's an important area of Islam dealing with the subject of balance. And if you said you want unconditional peace, that means peace at any cost. And it sounds good on the surface until you start to consider what that would mean. It means you want peace so bad that even if someone would come to you willing to rob you, you would say, well, take whatever you want. I want to be in peace. Okay. Or if they would come and want to molest the women, and you would say, well, I want to be in peace, so I won't defend them. And if you said, well, I don't want to defend my country, I just want to be in peace. So these things ultimately would no longer be acceptable because we've reached a limit. There's a line here that we can't cross. They're they're not realistic. It's not realistic. Not at all. Hmm. A human being will only go so far, and then they're defense mechanism built into them will cause them to rise up and there won't be peace. Mm. On the other hand, let's go to the other side of it. If somebody says they want unconditional war, no matter what you do, they're going to go to war anyway. Okay, this is very unsound psyche. And I can understand why people would be afraid if they thought that's what a particular religion was all about. Because when there's unconditional war, it doesn't matter what you offer, they want to fight. It doesn't matter if you said, okay, you guys can have anything you want. No, we just want to fight and kill people. Yeah. Well, how about if we sacrifice some people for you? No, we don't want that either. We just want to go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we do it? How do we get that balance? In Islam actually is teaching us that you cannot engage in any form of kital. We spoke about this word before. Yeah. Not jihad, but kital. You cannot engage in that unless certain conditions are prevalent. 
Let's take a look now and think about the time before Islam came. It's called the time of ignorance or jahiliya. During that time, we have the exact format to investigate to see what Islam is against. Yeah. Because so many of the things those people did, Islam is against. They were alcoholics. Islam is against that. Yeah. They were thieves. They would steal stuff. Islam is against that. Mm. They would lie. Islam is <coughs> against that. They would uh, mistreat women. Islam is against that. They would even take a newborn girl to the desert and bury her in the hot burning sand and let her die because of the chauvinism prevalent of their ignorance at that time. So what we would understand that Islam is going to be against most of these things, especially those that are very clearly wrong. Mm. Here's what it comes to the subject of war in those times of ignorance. The Arabs of that time had feuds that would go on for a very long time. One of the most classic of all of these feuds is the time of a big camel race. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but those camel races, when you see it from a helicopter, look like ants running across the sands of the desert. Perhaps you've seen National Geographic's yeah. uh, pictures about that. All these camels running, and you look at it, you say, those are ants, you know. Yeah. Well, in one of those great races, the winner of that, the camel that won, was killed by a boy who was very jealous and upset that somebody beat his camel. So he took a rock and went over and killed this camel. And then those people that owned the camel killed him. Then his family killed them. Then that family went back and this started a war that continued, they ending. said, for over 40 years. Oh, my goodness. 40-year war over a camel race. Now, that's only one example of many. So Islam is teaching us not to do that. To the extent the early Muslims were not allowed to fight at all. For 13 years, there were many confrontations facing the Muslims in which they were totally forbidden to engage in kital, active combat. However, Self-defense was always there. So this is a big misunderstanding in Islam to say that what we do is only in the line of defense. That's not true. Whether you call it kital or jihad, it is not just defensive. But it has rules and it cannot exist without certain conditions. Let's consider. We just discovered you can't do these feuds and you can't have wars going on and on over uh, frivolous things. Yeah. So what the Muslims learned in their experience was that we cannot engage in a collective combat against anybody unless certain things exist. One of the things the Muslims learned about is making treaties. They had to make treaties first, offer opportunities where we can live together in peace. If you do this, we'll do that. Not unconditional peace that says no matter what you do, we'll accept it. No. But also, not that we will be going beyond certain limits. So we'll put in writing, you'll do this, we'll do that, but we'll be okay with each other. Certain conditions to achieve that balance. Though. Absolutely. Mm. For instance, one of the clearest teachings from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that when we engage, we go up to the, a new area where Islam is being introduced, and we say, guys, we're here to talk about Islam. Do you accept that we'll come and talk about this in peace? If they say yes, great. Now, if they want to be Muslims, fantastic. Now suppose they say, okay, but we don't want to be Muslims. We don't. But will you allow us to practice our religion? Yes, okay. Again, we're in peace. We don't have a problem. But if they say, no, we don't want you talking about it and we don't want you to practice it, now we've got a problem. Because we cannot accept peace on this kind of condition. Because it means you're asking us to give up what we believe in. You're asking us to give up the very essence of our deen, our way of life itself. We can't accept that. Okay. Does anyone have any more questions regarding that, that finding that balance to achieve uh, peace? Uh, many people which I've met in the West believe that Muslims uh, begin wars and convey wars for one purpose, and that is to force everybody to accept Islam. 
that we conquer other nations just to make them Muslims. And that, that is our goal. Violently, How I do might you answer add. It's always the violent wars that, that we hear. Muslims go in violently and they took over this country violently. How, do you, how can you answer something like that? Let's look at another very basic principle in Islam. This is a clear teaching from the very beginning of Islam itself. Because... The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us that Allah said this. Now, this is a hadith Qudsi, Allah, a holy sacred hadith, that Allah says that before he ever created anything, he forbid himself to oppress. And the word is zulm in the Arabic language. And he forbids the believers to oppress, to commit zulm. So any oppression, aggression, violence, taking away rights. This is all forbidden from the beginning. And anything like that is violating the essence of Islam at, uh, from the beginning. But, but, when there is someone who is also coming the other way with their aggression, with their oppression, then Islam is teaching us how far to go and how far not to go. We'll go back to the subject we're talking about, the Arab Wars. Yeah. Okay? Now, while on the one hand, for 13 years, the Muslims were not allowed to engage in anything, it was to teach them what not to do. So when the order does come, they can understand what's called limits. We spoke about this in other programs, about rights and limits. Muslims have rights, but so do non-Muslims. But when people go beyond the limits, then what must be done? Now this is what we find in chapter 2 of the Quran in Surah Baqarah. This subject is related to something that occurred in particular called Hajj. So we go to verse 189, which begins with the words in Arabic, Yasalunaka. They are asking you, they're asking Prophet Muhammad a question, actually three questions. They're asking him about the new moons. Do we worship the moon? Because they used to worship the moon. No, these uh, teachings now are saying that we observe the moons, the new moons, etc., to gauge what? The months. And that's so that we can know when Hajj occurs. Okay, then, well, we're going to go to a small break now. We're going to come back and continue about the balance because I think it's very important to really assess that balance. And it's difficult to achieve that balance to achieve peace. So inshallah, after the break, we'll um, continue with um, Sheikh Yusuf Estes about, about the balance, inshallah. Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Ahmad in the program Back to the Prophet, wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted, so much so that quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Misconceptions. Just before the break, we were talking about how to find the limits and, and the balance to achieve peace in Islam. It's not very easy. So, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes, what's the next step? What's the next thing to, to, to achieving all of that? Charles? Right. Uh, Muhammad, I would say that it is easy if a person has a correct understanding. Where the problem comes in is the lack of understanding. That's why we have programs like this. And we want to be sure that everybody, especially the Muslims, understand what the rights and limits really are. We go back now to the verse that we were talking about, Yasalunika, they're asking you, and they mention the moons, because Allah is telling the Muslims about their pilgrimage or hajj that they must make. This is an order from Allah that we must perform this pilgrimage once in our lifetime when Allah makes a way and it's safe for us to go. 
So then in the same question, they're being asked about a superstition they had about being righteous by entering the back doors of their houses. But here we find out that Allah is saying, no, that's not righteous. Go in your house by proper doors. Righteousness is in your heart. Okay, it's very good teaching. Then when we move to the very next verse, it's a continuation in thought about the pilgrimage because it's saying to fight them in combat hmm. if they fight you in combat. And it's talking now about the Muslims going for Hajj back to their homeland of Mecca because they had been turned out from Mecca to live with sanctions against them in the desert. And if anybody would help them, the Meccans, who were idolaters, these were mushrikeen in Arabic language, not Jews, not Christians, by the way, and these own, their own relatives had turned them out and said, if anybody helps them, we'll kill you. you know? So they existed. There was some help that came to them, but they existed and it was pretty rough for a couple of years out there. Now, at that time, the Prophet's wife passed away, which was Khadijah, and his uncle, that was one of the biggest, strongest supporters they had, passed away. And then there were those who were saying back in Mecca, come on, guys, you know, they're not Muslims. They're saying, you know, this is kind of hard. This is our own relatives out here. What do you think? Mm. And trying to work toward assimilating or getting some of the folks back. And that there were those who said, no, you know, we got to really get tough now and crack down on them. So they had an idea to try to kill the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it was at this time that they had escaped and moved then in what's called the Hijra to Yathrib, a city which later be called, became known as uh, Medina. Medina yes, of course. So it was after a couple of years in Medina that they had tried to go for their Hajj or pilgrimage. They were turned back at the point of a sword telling them, no, you're not coming here, you're not going to perform your pilgrimage. Although other people could come and do a pilgrimage for false gods and things like that, they wouldn't let them come and do their pilgrimage, which Abraham used to do. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made a treaty. That's what we talked about. A treaty. They made an agreement. Okay, here's, a, here's an agreement. Anybody that we have with us as Muslims who you have a claim to, you're saying that your slave or it's your relative that you want, will allow you to take them back. But anybody who wants to be a Muslim and join us, we won't ask you to give them to us. We'll let that stay. And as they negotiated the agreement, the Meccans put extra stipulations in there. Like, we don't want you to say in the name of God. And we don't want you to say that the prophet of God. You just say Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. Yeah, so there's a lot of negotiation. Oh, the negotiation was sit. all, most, everything in the favor of the Meccans. But the prophet, peace be upon him, wanted to teach the Muslims how to make a treaty. A very beautiful, ironclad treaty that the Muslims had to stick with. Had to stick by. And they did stick by it. And even when they come back again, and they were turned away again. Yeah. It was tough on them. But finally, Allah made it clear that, okay, these people have broken their treaty, broken their word enough, all bets are off. That's it, guys. Now you go back, you do your hajj, and if, that's why it said if. There's always an if. If they are combating you in mortal combat, then even though you're wearing the garb of a pilgrim, this is understood quickly by Christians, they understand that, you're wearing the pilgrim's garb, but you still can fight. You can still fight with a sword even though you're in, and it will not break your hajj. It will not take you out of pilgrimage. So you can fight. If they fight you, you fight them in combat. If they're killing you, you kill them in combat. But if they stop, then you must stop. Otherwise, you're the one doing, and the word there, vulum, aggression, oppressor. You'll be doing that. Allah is not loving this aggressor or oppressor. Then it goes to the next verse. Again, really, really clear, and kill them in mortal combat. Wak to lahum. Ektal is the command of Kital. Again, because they are doing it to you. And then it says, and it becomes clear, drive them out from where they drove you out. And it's only talking about that specific incident because they were driven out 
of their homes, off their land. Everything was stolen from them. They were beaten, abused, raped, murdered. And now it's saying, with the limits, you can go back. You can't do anything to them unless they do something to you. Yeah, so unless they do something to you, you can only you know, fight back in that way. Does anyone else have any more questions regarding, regarding that? Or, or how, how, should, how can we answer people that say that Muslims are violent? Or, As we've or, said in other programs, we would, the come, easiest way? we would come to them back. Uh, no matter how they speak to us, we'll be nice. Yeah. We have to. Yeah. That's, that follows the suit of what Muslims are supposed to do. Thank you for asking me about my religion. Remember that? Yeah. Say it. Thank you for me about my and smile, yeah. Difficult then, as it might be. but Islam is based on truth. If I lie, I could go to hell forever. And then, Islam is having its resources preserved for 1,400 years. The Quran and the Sunnah in the Arabic language is clear. And we have it right there. And this is available for anybody who wants to read it, if you know Arabic, or get an Arabic translator to help you to know what the meaning is. And then we would say, if you hear something in the answer, it sounds better than what you have, would you be ready to reconsider and move to what's better for you? And leave it up to them. Then here's the answer. Islam is teaching us about a balance between rights and limits and peace and war. There cannot be unconditional war, nor can there be unconditional peace That's very important. in, in That's logical very important. thinking. There must be a way that we can live together in peace. I won't cross your line, and you also will not cross mine. I will respect you, your religion, your ideals, and you will respect mine. But there has to be a but, and there's nothing wrong with that but, the, the conditions and negotiations. But if you cross the line, if you break the agreements, then what do you want me to do? Mm. If you come breaking into my house, and uh, this would be self-defense. It's very important but because a lot of... if people are breaking into your whole community, the whole community should stand up against it. It's very them. important because a lot of people just say, no, Islam is peace unconditionally, and it's not realistic. Because people or like, they'll oh, yeah. say that it's only self-defense, and it's not. Yeah, there's also preemptive strike in Islam, and that is when you are aware that some are going to ultimately do something, you can cut them off at the pass, which was the very first battle. The Battle of Badr was not a self-defense battle, but it was one that was of a preemptive strike when they knew that the Meccans who were taking their property to be sold were passing close to Medina and they were afraid that they would come and attack them. So they went and cut them off at the pass and stopped them at the wells of better. And I think you know the story better than me. But the idea is that Islam is saying you must fight against oppression and tyranny. So we understand the greatest jihad of all is the jihad against oppression of any kind, whether it's self-oppression or oppression on the community or worldwide. You could literally say jihad is a war against terrorism. So I think we need to also define oppression, need to define peace and war. We, we actually need to know the meanings of, of each word before we can, we can get into it, isn't that right? Yeah. Certainly all of it is about understanding right. and sitting together and talking with all people concerned. This is very valuable. I always encourage Something us... Something we don't do, is it? A lot of people just can't, can't seem to do that. Partly the fault of the Muslims. Mm. It's important for all of us to be able to sit together. That's why I told you to start out with saying thank you so that the people will realize, okay, this is a guy I can talk to. And also so it puts you in the right frame of mind too to realize that this is not an enemy that you're talking to. Mm. This is a person who's concerned about having a better life just as you are. They're so inquiring, aren't they? They're we inquiring. want to open up doors of expression. We mm -hmm. want to open up doors to thought. We want to give people a chance to look and think and follow through. Then if they accept what we're teaching, then they'd like to be Muslim, fine and good. If they don't accept what we're teaching, we can still live together in peace, providing they don't violate this simple treaty. And that's allowing each to have their own space within the limits. And that has to be made clear straight away, pretty much, from the, the set rules, pretty much. This is the way this it is. This is and always the way of any society. Mm. It's the only way, isn't it? Okay, back to the studio audience. Any other final questions before we uh, wrap up the show for today? Um, I have a question. Did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam live with non-Muslims, and how did uh, he treat them, and how was the, the ties between them? Uh, that's a very good question, brother. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
never cut himself off from the people. It wasn't like that. In fact, he was sent as a mercy to all mankind. So if he had secluded himself, then he would not be fulfilling his purpose. Nor did any of his companions live like monks and cut themselves off or live like some kind of uh, hermits in a cave, as some people do. This was not the way of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. What we know is that he lived with them in peace, be they Jew, Christian, atheist, they could live in peace provided they would operate within the terms of their agreements. So, alhamdulillah, I learned something new today about the peace and war. I hope everyone else did. Um, about limits, negotiations, and really setting those limits and being straightforward and, and telling people what, you, what, what needs to be done. So, inshallah, everyone's benefited again from today. Thank you so much again um, for being on the show. Thank you to the studio audience. We're going to have to um, cut it there again. We've run out of time, unfortunately. Inshallah, next episode, we'll... Um, you know, t- touch up on some of the subjects again. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you ask me who my prophet is, I will say, haven't you heard? His name is Muhammad. A mercy to the world. A mercy to the world. If you ask me who my enemy is, I will say, don't you know? If you ask me who my enemy is, he's that same old devil, that same old devil.